Let's see if that 28-hour road trip was worth it. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your Daily Dose Guitar Information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. So this rare explorer showed up on Rhode Island's Craigslist that a longtime viewer and supporter of the show tipped me off to. So I made the trip, visited him for the first time, bought a couple of the guitars, and then was hoping and praying that this thing was legit and I wasn't going to be robbed. <laughs> Thankfully, it was okay. That's right, guys. I found it. The Stars and Stripes Explorer. non kaler version. So naturally, with a fancy beast like this, there is going to be a history lesson. Let's dive into that now. When the Explorer was first introduced, the year was 1958. They were a little bit too early. They looked like this. They were Karina. They didn't last too long, but the Explorer eventually got brought back in 1976 in a limited edition run. This time, they were mahogany bodies. They changed up the tuners and a few other specs, but overall, they were still very similar guitars. Then eventually, we get the Explorer II, better known as the E2, which has a really cool sculpted maple walnut body. But then, 1983 rolls along, and you get the birth of thrash metal explorers and Vs. That's when they introduce the alder body and the maple neck. Some of them have ebony boards, other ones have rosewood. It's the first cheaper explorer. We ditch the pick guard. We don't have a fancy mother of pearl logo. So those are your main explorer types. The 84, the 76, and the 58. But now we need to talk about the designer series, which I actually have new information on. So if you knew everything else, be prepared to take notes here. The designer series was Gibson's attempt to get in on the whole 80s craze of having graphics on your guitar, but offer them as factory options. Some of them look pretty cool, some of them are a little bit questionable, and you've got some weird squigglies, and they're not the most popular on the used and vintage market yet today, and many of them got equipped with Kaler tremolos, which generally collectors don't like. However, here's the new information. It was not Gibson doing these designs, it was actually hired out work. The original designer series guy who birthed the idea for Gibson, his name was Scott F. Kyle contacted me, and he said this was birthed as a chance collaboration when he worked on the then Gibson CEO's car, and he just happened to shoot his shot and say, you know, I could do really cool things with guitars. So he said, yeah, come on in on Monday, and we can talk. So eventually he produced some prototypes, and the series was greenlit, so Scott would be allowed in the factory at night when everybody else isn't working to apply the designs to the completed guitars. And then eventually it started to grow so much that he had to hire some other people to help him do it. And the reason why the designer series ends in 1985 is not because of low demand. It was actually due to fears of the company selling, contracts might be different. So he decided to call it quits there and stick on with his day job. And what I found really interesting is all the really attractive designer series guitars are accredited to Scott. He liked to do the straight lines. The weird squiggly ones, apparently that was someone else and like the painted on design. So there was more than one designer series guy, but this one being a straight line design, yes, Scott was part of doing this. So, within the designer series, there are the flag guitars. They are the most collectible ones out of them because they're usually a little bit unique. So there's the now highly controversial Rebel flag design. There's the now highly collectible Union Jack, which I just love these things. Make sure you check out the full review and demo if you're interested. Now, in my opinion, the Union Jack is still infinitely cooler because it's got it on the body, right? But it also has the matching headstock, and unfortunately, the Stars and Stripes didn't get that. Honestly, I would not have blamed you had you never even heard of the Stars and Stripes version, because the Stars and Stripes was actually birthed on the USA map guitar. So we documented the poster child in this episode, and I briefly mentioned those. Now you will notice the Explorers, the Stripes go the different way. So holding it like this, they point downwards, whereas on the USA map guitar, they point upward. Apparently there was like nine-ish of them. I highly question it. Scott couldn't remember how many he did. He didn't really have records like that. So if there's approximately nine of the map guitars, how many of these explorers might exist? I've only seen photos of three of them with Kaler and one other with a stop bar. That doesn't mean that those aren't repeat examples that have changed hands. I can't imagine that there's more than five, maybe six. Because the other two map designs, they got shared on this poster. There's no promotional material as far as I'm aware of for the Stars and Stripes fit. Finish. So the ones that do exist might have just been research and development, super small run, testing, and they decide not to do it full scale. So unless you've been looking at the Stars and Stripe map guitars, you probably didn't even realize these things were out there. But ever since the first time I saw them, I knew I wanted one of these in my collection, but it had to be the stop bar variety. So imagine my surprise when Mr. Gold sends me this one. But now we need to get into the story of how I got it, because this guy did not want to take cash. He wanted a specific guitar or gold. Not gonna lie, 
trying to set off some red flags. There's two different reasons why somebody doesn't want to take cash. A, they're trying to do tax evasion. Or B, it's stolen and they don't want it to be traced back to him. And the ad said, text me if you're serious. So I texted him. We go back and forth. He wanted a Martin D45. So I got to learn all about those things of how they're like the Les Paul custom of the Martin world and how they have so many cool limited editions, dragons and all this other weird stuff. And I just had a hard time justifying the price of one of those for this. I mean, those are $10,000 brand new. So I did end up coming across a deal that I thought would kind of work out. But in the back of my head, I was like, ah, if I buy this guitar and I drive all the way to Rhode Island and then the guy strums and goes, nah, this is not a good example. No, thanks. I would be incredibly let down because I don't gamble with my time like that. Right. So a couple of days of non-communication goes by and he actually comes back and says, I will take this much money for it. And it's at that point where I'm like, OK, th this guy might be legit. And when I got to the house, I was a little bit nervous because, you know, it's Craigslist. You drove a long way. He knows you're out of your element. It actually turned out he's a deal. I had nothing to worry about. This came out of a collection that was kept in Cape Cod for years and they wanted to liquidate it all because I think he had died. So he had bought the entire collection and he was just piecing it out. But he's a very old school guy. He had so many stories about golden era guitars, you know, before they were ridiculously expensive. He called the bursts the Les Paul flame tops. That's how I knew he was an old school guy. So he shared some cool stories with me. So there we go. That is the tale of this one. Big long road trip and I guess that's just kind of my thing with my family because we had recently gotten that regal blue from the original owner that was close to my son's birthday so family road trips for unique explorers i guess is just my thing but to learn more about these stars and stripes explorer let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench see if we can get it cleaned up and learn anything more about it To say this thing cleaned up nicely would be an understatement. This thing just came back to life. So let's start with our pickups. We actually have stock white plastics. That is correct for the Stars and Stripes finish. And if you go back to earlier in the episode, there's like some colorations and picking scratches. Thankfully that all came off during my polish job. The pickups themselves are double black coils and they have two rows of adjustable pull pieces. And that's because they are Gibson's Dirty Fingers pickup set. That's what the 80s style explorers came with. So whenever you see a date stamp like this, three digits and then either three or four, this one tells you the model, so 404 and 427. Honestly, I've never seen a good diagram to tell us about that, but I can tell you what this is. This is your date stamp, so that's seventh month of 1981. And this one is the eighth month of 1981. Fun story, when I was trying to take this guitar apart, these were like glued to the top. I could not get them to come off. Looked like something sticky had gotten underneath them, like maybe a player's sweat or maybe they had something on their hands, but that all cleaned up. I was scared for a minute. I wouldn't be able to remove it because the finish is almost like cracking and flaking up right there. I had to be very careful that this wasn't like attached to the finish. Like they put the pickups on too soon before it had cured. <laughs> it's just going to like rip it off. That was a little bit nerve wracking, but everything panned out. But now let's check our readings. Bridge 15.17k ohms. That is correct. And our neck is running strong as well at 15.35. And our middle position for fun, 7.63. So you can see the tenon of the neck extend into our cavity here. That is still a maple neck, but that is very clearly mahogany. You can also see it over here in our bridge pickup cavity a little bit. I might be saying, hey, Trogley, didn't you say that these were alder bodies? Okay, first two years, 83 and 84, but in 85, most of Gibson's alder body guitars switch over into mahogany again. For example, when the Les Paul Studio was first introduced, the first two years are alder bodies with maple necks. So it does appear the Explorers followed the very similar suit. As far as our bridge and tailpiece, on this one it's just regular stuff. That means a Nashville style bridge made by Schaller in Germany, and then a full weight tailpiece with casting mark only in the center. Now we need to talk about the designer series stripes again. Unfortunately, the wooden body moves with humidity changes. The stripes do not. That causes this effect where cracks form within your decals and graphics. That's just to be expected on all of these. Now some are obviously worse than others. Kind of gives it a cool aged vibe at the same time. There's kind of a crazy one right here. Thankfully, it's not like a break in the wood. Now this one, it is common for finish checks to occur between these knobs because they're such high stress areas. It's possible that could also be in the wood. We'll have to take a look in the back to see if we see any obvious splits, but most likely just in the decal. Check out our knobs. That is stock in our Battle Flag series. They use these clear knobs probably to help you kind of see through to the design. 
To know their stock and original, they have the white in the center, and it's very common for these things to break and have to be replaced. But that's two volumes and a master tone for your triangle layout, as people call it. And in case you didn't notice, yeah, no pick guard on these. As far as the rest of the body, there were a lot of like black smudges and stuff all over this thing and picking scratches. Thankfully, most of that actually came off. I was surprised. I mean, you still got a little bit. Down here, it used to be completely covered in marks that looked like that. So I don't know what had caused that, but most of it was just grime that needed cleaned off. Then the rest, a little bit of stand rash. Now we do have a touch-up area here, there, and then kind of a really big ugly one right there. At one point in time, that touch-up looked good, but as the finish continued to age, <laughs> it just didn't look good anymore. That's why my advice is never, ever touch up a white guitar. Sure, that bottle of whiteout's gonna look good for about a year, and then the finish is gonna age, and then it just stands out even worse than a ding, but you know, it's part of the history on this one. So moving on from our mahogany body, we've got our maple neck with an ebony fretboard. The frets polished up beautifully. I wouldn't say they were terrible. Definitely, I've been sitting in a case for the past 30 years and I haven't had any love in a while. So I went ahead and gave it the full deluxe treatment today. What's kind of cool is this is actually figured ebony in certain areas. You see how it kind of plays and dances in the light right there? It's not that way everywhere, but it's got nice tight wood grain as well. Frets are in really good condition for the age of this thing too. And we've got our really cool acrylic dot inlays. The overall condition of the board's not too bad either. I didn't see any fingernail divoting or anything. But there is a small chip in it down there, but that might have been factory. Typical 24 3 quarter inch scale length and 12 inch fretboard radius. The nut measures 1.73 inches and increases to 2.07 by the 12th. First fret neck depth 0.81 and 0.1 by the 12th, but I'd still categorize it as a 60s neck profile. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. Now moving on to the headstock. It does have some threads sticking out past the top of our truss rod. However, a lot of my Union Jacks were set this way from the factory as well, and since we've got the black paint over it, I believe that's how this one left too, but I would classify it as near limited adjustability. But it works just fine. Thankfully, I got that photo before I made a big trip, so I knew what to expect. Here's what our truss rod cover itself looks like. It's aged, but doesn't say anything. Then here's another bummer about this one. You've got some finish chipping around the tuners. Those tuners were ridiculously loose, so I tightened those up, and again, I could touch those up. I have the Gibson lacquer pen to do the job, but most times it doesn't end up looking that good. Just because it looks black doesn't mean that it doesn't have a slight yellowed over amber hue to it like the rest of the guitar, so matching it is difficult. We've also got a little ding up here at the top of the headstock too. And something about this headstock just seems a touch wider than usual. It's because the white finish runs up along the edge, so it nearly has a bound headstock look. You don't find that on Explorers too often. As we shine the light over it, you can see some impressions, nicks and dings, nothing too crazy. Again, it cleaned up very nicely. In person, you can actually see the mahogany wood grain lacquer sink just barely. And of course, we've got some more dings and impressions over here. I mean, it looks like a strap left some scratches or impressions in this area as well. Surprisingly though, the corners aren't in too bad a shape. Especially this one, they usually get really beat up. But our electronics are really clean. So no visible pot coat on this one because it's covered by the wires. This one, we can only make out the 1984. And this one, same thing. Can't read our week, but it's probably pretty late. This is another area where you can see through to the mahogany body and you've got some employee sign-offs in various areas. We've got a strap button down here, and then they're on the edge, on the top here. It's a terrible location, they fall off, that's why you see a lot of guys move them back here. The back of the neck's pretty much like everything else, there's a ding right there. A little bit of the clear coat has been worn, so there is a spot on the neck that's a little bit more white than the rest, but that's pretty common. And I remember at the guy's house when I was looking at it, this impression line caught my attention because it's like, ah, that's in a strange area. We'll check it out under blacklight just in case. But our serial number dates to 1985, 108th day of the year, 553 in production, Nashville produced. And here's our Schaller style tuners. And even the tip of the headstock isn't in too bad a shape. Just a little bit of discoloration. Looks like it rubbed up against a ceiling or something. Now the moment of truth. Yeah, I'd say that black lights evenly. Just some sort of an impression. Maybe even like a stand mark or something. I'm not sure. But that all looks good enough to me. See the light clear coat aging as I was talking about? 
And that's just the sun coming through on the window. It's not like weird stuff. See, that'll move. And then, hey, this is actually pretty sweet. <laughs> I like that, a glowing green stars and stripes flag. This would go good at like a mini golf course. I especially like how the pickup rings also glow a similar color. And our headstock is also looking peachy. And that must only be in the finish because I didn't see anything in the control cavity. This rare explorer weighs 8 pounds, 13.4 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. I'd say this thing has some really nice mellow tones to it. Despite being super hot, dirty fingers pickups, they do clean up nicely if you pick softly. Distorteds are really good on this one. Not every Dirty Fingers pickup set is good, but I've been getting lucky lately. Sometimes I think it might just be my mood though, but this is really punchy and aggressive without being over the top. <laughs> Now that we know all about the rare Stars and Stripes Explorer, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Was it worth the journey and the risk and all the good stuff? Yeah, at the end of the day, I think it is. Is this the most desirable Explorer out there? Maybe not to most people, but as a collector, finding this particular one out of the designer series is pretty tough, especially in the configuration that we happen to find it in today. And it's quite the player and sounds pretty terrific. So that's always a win in my book. But for everyone else, if you don't want to spend crazy money, buy yourself a white explorer.
it's pretty much the exact same thing, except for this one just had some tape put on top before they put the clear coat on. So you tell me, which one's better, the Union Jack or the USA? They're just both great iconic pieces of Gibson history. So, all right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.